Hello everybody, welcome back to our YouTube channel. I have our two registered dietitians of Sculpt You, Melody and Brianna today here. We're having a cute little girls weekend, as I told you guys earlier, so I'm super excited and we're gonna answer your guys' questions today. So anyway, let's get into it. Are you guys fucking ready? Oh yeah. So ready. You ready? Oh, by the way, P.S. This is not medical advice. Wait, what is it? <laughs> Informational and educational purposes only. There you go. So the main reason I want to do this Q&A is mainly just for you to feel more confident and secure within your health and your body, have them answer some questions. I get these questions all the time, mainly on hormone health, et cetera, and all the things. And I want you guys to feel, okay, where do I go? Because it's so confusing, all the information you see all over the place, everywhere. So we want to just answer some of your best questions. Let's get into it. Right, we're going to start off with the question, how do you even count calories and track macros? Yeah, so I, the first thing that I tell people to do is the first thing, or the first thing you want to do is collect data to figure out where you're even at. Um, because especially women, I feel like a lot of us, and I say us because it's been part of my journey too, we under eat, whether it's intentionally or we're just skipping meals, we forget to eat, we get busy. And of course, like diet culture will have us believing we need 12 or 1500 calories. And that's considered under eating for most women, especially if they're active. So I tell people, you know, if, if it's okay with you, as far as like for your mental health, if you can objectively count your calories for like three or four weeks and just kind of see where you're at, like where you're actually averaging. And then within the Sculpt you membership, we actually have a calorie calculator that is based on the TDEE, which is total daily energy expenditure formula. This will take into account height, weight, age, and activity level, and it gives you your estimated maintenance needs. So it's not necessarily saying this is what you're maintaining your weight on because the calculator has no idea, like the state of your metabolism, your stress, your diet history, anything. So it's literally just an educated guess, but you can say, okay, well, let me compare what I'm actually averaging, uh, even just over these three to four weeks with what the calorie calculator is telling me, because this will say, okay, well, I'm actually right around where I need to be, or maybe I do need to go ahead and work on what we refer to as a reverse diet and slowly intentionally increase those calories just to repair our metabolism so that if something like a fat loss phase is something that we wanna go through, we get our body prepped for that phase where it's not just an extra stressor to us. So first thing we wanna do is collect that data, compare it to our estimated needs, and then I typically will tell people, focus on calories first, and then once that's down, then start looking at how your actual macros are shaping up. Like, oh, well, I could do a little bit more carbs in the morning, I could have a little bit more protein, and just make the adjustments as needed. And of course, <clears throat> we do have a macro guide PDF located within the meal plan system, so if you guys ever have questions and you're a Sculpt2 member about how to calculate calories and macros, and also how do I make adjustments based on my physique goals, that reverse dieting, like how do I make this applicable to me? There's a ton of information in there. And so how do you actually track your calories? So say they wanted to actually get that base, yeah. how would they do that, you know, day-to-day -day basis with their food? Yeah, I, I love using something like MyFitnessPal or Chronometer. You just, you want a good app that has a nice database. And of course you can always, um, enter in your own foods, but that is time consuming. And this isn't something that you have to do forever. Even just in the beginning, just to, again, get a baseline, see where you're at. And with tracking macros, you do need to be a little bit more specific. So we do recommend using like a food scale um, because you know we, we wanna get it to the exact grams if we are really um, getting into the macros. But otherwise, like I said, if you're just looking at calories, that's okay too. And you also have to keep in mind that nutrition facts labels are not always 100% accurate. We can't rely on what something like an Apple Watch is telling us or the treadmill is telling us we're burning for calories. <laughs> it's not accurate. And that's why with our calculator, we allow you to choose your activity level because it's just based on your average. It really, you should not be making adjustments every single day. There, yeah. It's hard to see if you're making progress that way. Yeah. I feel like that's a good place to start too because I feel like a lot of people like, jump in and like are overwhelmed like they want to get like their calories perfect their protein you know everything perfect all at once but like seeing where you're at like as a baseline before like jumping right in like i think that's a great great place yeah. to start it's because it can be so overwhelming and it's not for everybody to track and like i said it doesn't have to be long term but there's so much value in using macro counting as a tool as it should be used it doesn't have to be 
this restrictive practice that you use. And I think a lot of people, um, especially whenever they're really getting into macro tracking or they have been for a while, it can become more of like an obsessive thing. Yeah. And that's, that's dangerous territory whenever we start to feel like, oh my God, I can't eat this meal or I can't go out with my friends or my partner without making sure that I enter it into my app or like I've planned for it then we're kind of moving away from having that healthy relationship with food. With your guys' clients, do you make sure they're in a state where they're prepared to see those numbers? Or is that a conversation you would have? And if you would recommend, hey, if you wanna track your calories, let's make sure it doesn't become an obsessive practice yeah. and like you're using it for the benefit of your health in this way. Yeah, absolutely. I know with me and my clients, we have a conversation just even about their relationship with food first because let's say someone does have a rocky relationship where they have counted calories in the past, but for me, I, I know that they're under eating. Well, what I will typically do is I'll have them keep a food journal and I will calculate it myself. Mm -hmm. And I can just give them some bare minimum feedback. Like, let's just do, you know, an extra half cup of this, like yep. without telling them any numbers because we can get so pigeonholed in oh, yeah. that, you know? And so I think still being able to give them feedback, um, just like if, you're a dietitian and you're working with someone in eating disorder recovery, you kind of have to hold some of that stuff back because Absolutely. as soon as they hear the numbers, their red flags are going up and you know they, they're so comfortable in what they've been doing with their diet that it's hard for them to make changes. But if you can also, you know, meet them where they are and understand that your relationship with food and your body is complex and you've probably had you know, a complex relationship with it your entire life, especially mm -hmm. if you're a woman growing yep. up in the yeah. early 2000s, <laughs> oh, yeah. like we yeah. all were like diet culture, it, just, it, it was crazy. And I think for everybody being able to evaluate what their current relationship with food is and where they would like it to be. Because a lot of my clients, especially, they know I don't want to obsess about calories forever, yeah. but mm -hmm. it's hard to get out of that cycle. And especially if you have physique goals, which it does require us to be a little bit more nitty gritty whenever yeah. it comes to that, but that doesn't mean we have to count calories forever. Prep, I actually haven't counted calories since, you know, college. Um, I just know, okay, but based off that counting calorie period and based off tracking period, I understand, okay, I'm definitely under eating here. Mm -hmm. There's not enough food here today. Mm -hmm. um, but I love the journal idea because that's something you can keep for yourself. So just write even down what you're eating and look at it and be like, wow, I didn't really eat much today yeah. or whatever that is the case is. It so, is, you know, it's a great like learning tool to see like, like, and then I feel like you learn like what's in foods like yeah. mm -hmm. macro wise, like protein calories, yeah. like fats, you know, just yep. by tracking for a little while. Yeah. yeah, and even like how you feel, like say that you write it down and you're not writing down, oh, I had half a cup of this, like you have no idea. You just write <laughs> down, you know, this is what I had. But then I tell people, write down how you feel 30 mm -hmm. minutes after you me your meal and write down how you feel two hours after your meal. If it's, I'm just so sluggish, which is a little bit normal, all of our blood is going to our digestive system after we eat, like, so we're not just, gonna have all this energy right yeah. with, like right away but if you're feeling just I need to take a nap after I eat this meal we may need to look at what your macro balance was maybe you had too many carbs at that and it's making mm -hmm. you feel sluggish because it spiked your blood sugar maybe you didn't have enough and so you're really just fatigued so I think it, not even just in the calorie macro wise I think it can really help you figure out like what your body responds best to food wise and using a food journal is also a great way to identify food sensitivities because we can't rely on a lot yeah. of those like online food sensitivity tests so if you know like every single time I have this in my coffee I have a reaction well that's telling you something yeah so with that do fats and carbs matter as long as you're hitting your protein goals so does your macronutrient balance matter or at meals does it matter oh yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. like protein is so pushed in like the health and fitness mm. industry it is important for sure and of course if we're building muscle tissue we want to make sure we're getting enough and we talk so much about carbs like being so important and the reason is is just because they don't get enough attention but honestly even girls who are eating enough protein it's typically a lot of like protein powders and protein bars so it's not necessarily high quality or they're just using things like collagen like what i refer yeah. to as like protein toppers they're not whole food forms yeah. and they're not like in the proper balance with carbs at that meal and that's going to lead to some blood sugar issues later on and so we just want to make sure that like if you're paying attention to a high protein diet it's not at the expense of carbs and fats and i think a lot of people especially with like 
keto diets and stuff like that, they kind of get wrapped up in like, well, as long as I hit my protein, that's all that matters. And wherever carbs and fats lie, you know, yeah. it, it'll work out as long as I hit my calorie goals and as long as I hit my protein. But really, your energy levels are going to tank. You can lose your period. Your skin just will not be healthy. I mean, we need all three macronutrients for a reason. And any time that you are restricting one of those, the body will compensate. And we don't need that extra stress. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're looking at a plate, what would you say would be like balanced portions of like carbs, protein, and fat, if that makes sense? Yeah. Well, I think. And I know like I'm sure Brianna has seen this, especially yeah. in like a clinical practice. Mm -hmm. they, they like to teach us if you vision a, a plate, you know, you have protein as like a fourth of your plate, another fourth is your complex carbs, and then the other half is veggies, just really fibrous yeah. foods. Yeah. And that that is okay for some people, but you know, I think for a lot of people, as long as they're striving for like anywhere between 25 and 35 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. And then they're also making sure that they're getting, you know, somewhere between like 30 and 60 grams of carbs. They feel pretty good. And yeah. the cool thing about fats is with our protein sources, we usually get the fat. So mm -hmm. most people don't have to intentionally find fat. Like and with, yeah, yeah. And like with cooking oils and stuff mm -hmm. like that, it's really easy to get those in. Um, but yeah, I, I think blood sugar management is a big part of like the plate method and like mm -hmm. portioning things and i know like you see that in the clinical setting too yeah. yeah yeah so one of the most asked questions is pcos and nutrition so let's go dive into it what is pcos and what kind of food focus changes diet changes you have to make and all the things. Yeah, so PCOS, um, I know a lot of you guys are really interested in hormone health, which yeah. really excites me because that's my biggest passion. Um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, really whenever it comes to nutrition, we want to manage blood sugar um, because this can kind of lead to a ripple effect with our sex hormones. Specifically, estrogen will be really high and that's also gonna lead to some high inflammation. So PCOS, kind of like IBS, is not necessarily a diagnosis itself. It's more of an umbrella term to describe a collection of different Super symptoms. So like a collection of different diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just, well, what's this one food or this one supplement I can take? It's really, we need to start back with the basics. We need to start with those foundations and blood sugar management, stress management, eating anti-inflammatory foods. These are all so important and often so neglected. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, so many women that, I, that I've worked with who have PCOS, especially in like the fitness space, they're still eating a ton of processed foods. They're eating yeah. a lot of fit bars and shakes and just chugging protein shakes all day. And like, that's okay every once in a while, but we have to look at these ingredients. Most of the time they're inflammatory. A lot of these women are waking up and they're having a fasted workout or they're drinking coffee on an empty stomach. That sets us up for a blood sugar roller coaster all day. And then their meals and snacks throughout the day, maybe they're just not balancing protein to their carb ratio or the quality of carbohydrates that they're getting are just not ideal. And not to say that we can't have like you know, processed foods yeah. and like breads and like those kind of carbs, like grains. Um, but I do find that whenever my clients use things like root vegetables, like squash and potatoes and carrots and fruits and even things like maple syrup and honey because of like the fructose content and our ability to just more efficiently utilize those carbs, yeah. they don't have the spikes and the crashes when it comes to their blood sugar. And the thing about blood sugar is a lot of people don't pay attention to it unless they have diabetes. Yeah. or they've been diagnosed like pre-diabetic or they have a family history of it and not necessarily that we have to wear like a glucose monitor every day mm -hmm. i think that can get a little you know almost like orthorexic like Absolutely. if we can become really obsessed with those numbers and like keeping it stable but i think it can be just like micro counting like yep. another tool in our toolbox and so whenever we're utilizing the right carbohydrate sources we're getting enough protein we're calming down inflammation we're managing stress we start to see the PCOS resolve. And this is gonna come from months and months of consistency. Absolutely. You know, make sure that you don't expect changes after, you know, four weeks or like yeah. we have an amazing hormone health meal plan. And just even following that is not necessarily gonna balance your hormones because it's so multifactorial that we just really, again, wanna get back to those basics. But the blood sugar management is the biggest component that I see. So what are the biggest tools for blood sugar management? 
And what does that mean if someone's like, what the fuck is blood sugar? <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? Like, yeah. you know, I've only heard that when it comes to diabetes. So like, that's not what I have. Yeah. So what is the importance of blood sugar? Because yeah, most people hear that term when it comes to diabetes and they've never thought about it with their own health. Yeah, well I know like, for blood sugar, like I said, a lot of people are not paying attention unless it's yeah. a problem. But it's so important for all of us to just even think like, okay, why are my energy levels like this? Yeah. Or, you know, like, why is this food affecting me in this way? When it comes to blood sugar, I tell people the first thing we have to start with is getting that breakfast within an hour of waking. I mean, we have to set and the no tone. no starting your morning with coffee, okay? Exactly. Yeah. We have to <laughs> set the tone for the entire day when it comes to our metabolism, when it comes to that blood sugar roller coaster. That breakfast first thing will make or break you so if you're fasting if you're having just a little protein bar if you're having coffee on an empty stomach you're setting yourself up for failure for the next 24 hours sleep is also super yep. important that's going to affect your blood sugars and there's even been studies that show like identical twins having different blood sugar responses to the same foods mm -hmm. because it really comes down to what does your microbiome look like yep. what does your stress levels look mm -hmm. like compared to this other person and also after you have your breakfast, make sure that you're eating consistently throughout the day. Like I typically say every three to five hours, mm -hmm. if you're someone that you're coming from a more undernourished state, like you've been under eating or you've been under a lot of stress, you have a lot of health issues, you may need to eat closer to that three hour mark because you're not storing that glucose. You're really mm -hmm. using it up really fast. And the liver and the muscles can only store so much at a time. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people, especially in the morning, whenever it comes to skipping breakfast they've rebranded it and just called it intermittent fasting but it's really yeah. just skipping meals you yeah. know and yeah. and like yes there can be benefits to short-term fasting but you have to think for someone with a healthy liver they're only storing eight to ten hours of blood sugar yeah most of the women i'd say you know 95 percent of the women that i'm working with are not metabolically healthy so yeah. they need a bedtime snack or as soon as they wake up in the morning we love to see it yeah they really <laughs> do as soon as they wake up in the morning they they have to have something to eat. And I understand a lot of people, they're waking up, they're, oh, I'm just not hungry, or I'm even nauseous in the morning. Yes, but that, I see. Yes, and, and that's honestly, that's because of the stress hormone. Exactly. When our blood sugar drops while we're sleeping because we've exhausted all of our stores, then those stress hormones go up. And that's what prevents us from having those hunger, those hunger hormones. Yeah. So we automatically feel like, oh, food, right away. Yeah. And so you'll notice, Sometimes whenever we make these changes, we have to go against our grain because we're we're trying to get out of this cycle. So if you are relying on yourself to have the appetite to eat, mm -hmm. you're just gonna stay stuck in this. So unfortunately, sometimes we have to kind of force ourselves to still have that, even if it's literally two or three bites of something. Yeah. Get a couple bites of carbs, get a couple bites of protein. The more consistent that you are with that, you're gonna start waking up with a full, healthy appetite, and that is a good sign. Oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. This morning. Morning. Yeah, absolutely. After, after all the help in the scope, I mean, I use the hormone meal plan, but yeah, I'm ready to go in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. And also like as far as like blood sugar balance and like pairing, you know, carbs with fats and protein, that's also gonna help with satiety. Like yeah. if you're eating like an apple for a snack, like yeah. you're gonna feel hungrier a lot sooner than you know if you pair an apple with some nuts. So like yeah, dressing nuts. your carbs. Yeah, yes. exactly. Like you're okay. you really like wanna try to avoid having naked carbs, yeah. you know? And then mm -hmm. as also Pouring. like your blood sugar if you're having just a carb like you're gonna crash a lot faster like when you pair it with a fat or a protein you really you know it's a it's a lot more like you instead of just crashing yeah, yeah it's just you know big spike it's yeah like, oh, it's a little more steady yeah, yeah. And you have you know more energy yeah you're fuller so with you know. blood sugar balance obviously we have okay let's dress our carbs it's putting that balance plate protein carbs fats are there any other tools that people can use to really help that obviously lower your stress mm -hmm. um, cortisol levels etc but are there other tools people can incorporate within there well like i said day? the sleep is really important so make sure that you're getting good sleep if you're having issues with sleep the bedtime snack may be something you actually really need yeah. especially if it's been a few hours like say you eat dinner at 5 p.m you're not going to bed till 9 10. you may be going ahead and like you you may be experiencing that low blood sugar already just tucking yourself in the bed so yeah. have a little bedtime snack it doesn't have to be anything big but set yourself up to have a good day the next day and something that i found is 
um, having something like diluted apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. um, in water, like a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar before your meals or with your meals, that also kind of blunts that glucose spike actually by like up to 40%. Can and you have the apple cider vinegar with a little bit of like lemon and honey? That's oh fine. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. It makes yeah. it really yummy. It right? tastes yeah. a lot better. I think it's delicious. Like yeah. I do warm apple cider vinegar and I do like a little teaspoon mm -hmm. and then I do in a couple or a little bit of water and then I do a little bit of raw honey and a little bit of lemon and yeah, it's delicious. And I, whenever it comes to like what your meals actually look like, I tell people there's this old saying, eat breakfast like a king, eat lunch like a prince, eat dinner like a peasant. And that is Ooh. for blood sugar. We really want the majority of our food to come in the morning. And that's going like to set your blood sugar up yeah. a lot better. A queen, a princess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. And even going for a walk after like 10, 15 yeah. minutes after mm -hmm. you eat, especially a really big meal like mm -hmm. that, you know, has a ton of carbs. Or, or like, do a little twerk in your room. Yeah. <laughs> really just use your just muscles in any way because they're going to soak up that extra glycogen. Yep. And you're going to get that nice little pump. And like, you're going to feel good afterwards. And it's just going to keep that blood sugar from spiking and dropping. Yeah. I, I love that. And, and the thing is like balance your meals too, because it's not just, oh, well, I'm eating every three hours, but like Brianna said, like I'm just grabbing an apple, like I'm just yeah. randomly snacking. Mm -hmm. We're not doing what we need to yep. to optimize that blood sugar. So great questions. I want to know what are some of your guys' favorite, you know, foods that really support your hormones? Mm -hmm. Because that's a huge question I'm seeing is what do I even eat? Obviously you mentioned root vegetables, but what are some other things people can incorporate? Yeah. So the hormone health meal plan, it's, it's a bit different from the other meal plans that like Brianna writes because oh I didn't even classify that yeah she writes our <laughs> vegan meal plan gluten soy and dairy free and our lifestyle meal plan which is just if you're really getting into like eating healthy want to incorporate some foods but also like you're not don't want to go full yeah. um, into it mm -hmm. and then Melody does our hormone health meal plan yeah so like I always compare like the finding balance meal plan to the hormone health meal plan mm -hmm. I always say like the finding balance meal plan anything goes yeah. we include animal foods plant foods there's desserts which we put on every meal plan <laughs> I mean it's really the just yes. it, it's really just to help people understand that you can eat whole foods and it can be enjoyable and you're gonna feel good and it's in a balanced way and whenever it comes to the hormone health meal plan we focus a lot more on animal proteins just mm -hmm. because of the bioavailability of their nutrients mm -hmm. you're not gonna get the same amino acid profile from plants and the myth of we can just eat a whole bunch of different plants and it will somehow make up to that profile the body doesn't work that way and so animal proteins are just a lot more efficient and especially whenever it comes to like our minerals like zinc for yeah. example we want to make sure that we're getting basically like the most bang for our buck and you know we, we talked about blood sugar when you think about plant-based proteins mm -hmm. yeah you're getting protein but you're also getting carbs and fats and yeah whenever it comes to animal proteins you're just getting that whopping amount of protein Protein. Yeah, you know, 25 grams of protein instead of 25 grams of protein plus 14 grams of carbs and two yeah. grams of fats. And so it is a lot easier for people to manage their blood sugar when they do include mm -hmm. animal products. And then like you mentioned with the carbs, I focus a lot on the root vegetables, mm -hmm. the squash, potatoes, carrots. We do a lot of the uh, raw carrot salad oh, so for, for some healthy so estrogen, good. for some estrogen detox, um, which is delicious. Um, just because they're a lot more efficient for our body, like we can just utilize them a lot more. It doesn't take a lot of energy and then of course we still include you know good healthy fats especially mm -hmm. like our grass-fed butters and ghees and mm -hmm. avocado and olive oils and we do still include things like desserts like our more fun items mm -hmm. but something I also like to do is include a lot of um, adrenal cocktails which is basically just a way of replenishing your minerals so my go-to is like pineapple or orange juice coconut water and some sea it's salt delicious. so if you guys are relying on stuff like rice crispy treats or sour <laughs> she's strips calling out. She's calling <laughs> right now. for these intro workout carbs like just swap it out and have some kind of adrenal cocktail because not only are you not getting these inflammatory ingredients that are in these little food items, but you're replenishing your minerals as yeah. you're also getting the carbs from the juice and from the coconut water. Yeah. So it's it's perfect. And we Which also is the point of what the rice crispy would be exactly. getting. It's like a high spike of carbs yes. and glucose to get yes. that energy spike. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it's just in a much healthier way. Yeah. Yeah. And we also include like herbal teas, warm lemon water, you know, just little bonuses. Um, it's not necessarily gonna balance your hormone on its own. Yeah. It's just 
how can I support hormones? Exactly. And so all of us, every single human, we have hormones and we should probably all be focusing on that, mm -hmm. especially in today's world where the majority of women do have some kind of hormone issues. And the thing is, I always, uh, I always describe our sex hormones, our estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, as more of like the last stop on the train. So if those are out of balance, that means it started a long time ago. So we wanna go back to those foundations and with the Hormone Health Meal Plan, we're incorporating the foods that give your body the building blocks they need to function optimally mm -hmm. and in the right balance to keep the blood sugar stable. So it's not just a roller coaster all day. Well, am I eating this just because it fits my macros, but mm -hmm. is it actually serving me? Yeah. And I feel like when it comes to hormones, like I really like to emphasize the importance of fats because I feel like so many people, not so much anymore, but like mm -hmm. people just assume that like you need a low fat diet to like mm -hmm. lose weight. Oh my yeah. God. And Do you guys yeah. remember all the low fat items like yeah. grocery store? Yeah, going literally, yeah. like everything. <laughs> and like I feel like it's so easy to just cut fats out of your diet mm -hmm. and like to try to lose weight that way, but really yeah. you're doing way more harm than good. Yeah. And oh, yeah. um, you know, balancing things and getting the correct amounts of fats, you know, keep your hormones in check and you know, over time, you know, it's you're gonna lose the weight. It's yeah. not like a quick fix. Like yeah. you're not just gonna. What is the recommended like amount of fats you would say? Because I think for a lot of women, if they see a higher number, it's like, holy shit, that's terrifying. Yeah. And even you mentioned earlier, you were like, oh yeah, 30 to 60 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know that people are gonna be like, that's what? a lot. Like, yeah. That's, yeah. what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone's so different. Yeah. Like fat, you know, we try to keep it a. I like to use to percentages. Yeah. yeah. Twenty to thirty-five percent of your yeah. calories. And then because it's gonna be different for everyone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and so it's hard to even say like even per meal because yeah. you could have a higher fat dinner and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. And fat is so important, just like Brianna said earlier, for satiation. So mm -hmm. we wanna make sure we're still getting the proteins and fats, but I really like to look at macros in terms of percentage of your overall calories because everybody can kind of use that instead mm -hmm. of, oh, these specific grams, but you weigh an extra 50 exactly. pounds, so it's yeah. different for you. Yeah. So when it comes to carbs, I typically will recommend 40 to 65%, and again, like the 60 to 65 could be very high for some people, yeah. and I get that, but it's more of like a safe range, right? Yeah. And the 40 is the lowest range. So like for people who lowest. have, yes, so people who have insulin resistance, people who have PCOS, yeah. they may need to start on that lower range, but mm. then, as time goes on and they're reversing that insulin resistance, they can tolerate more carbs and they feel better on higher carbs. That's another thing I see a lot of people being diagnosed with PCS, PCOS and saying like, I cannot eat carbs, yeah. this isn't good for me. Yeah. And is that a myth with some mentality there? No, it, it's really the insulin resistance yeah. component. And, and that's the thing, like we do have to work with our body and where it's at, but that yeah. doesn't mean that the way that we eat for that short period of time has to be forever. We should not be yeah. on a low carb yeah. diet forever. Yeah. And and to go back to the, the macro question, um, when it comes to protein, you know, 15 to 30% of calories, when it comes to fats, 20 to 35%. So with these, with these ranges, you can see like, it can be different for everybody. For a lot of people, especially just starting out macros, um, especially if they're okay with being on a little bit lower of a carb diet, they typically do well on 40% carbs, 30% fat, 30% protein because mm -hmm. they're feeling satiated from the fat and protein, but they're still getting enough carbs to where they're not, you know, crashing their thyroid. They're not breaking yeah. down that thyroid gland. They're not losing their period. They still have energy. They're, they're mm -hmm. still sleeping good. And so it's not at the expense of any of the uh, of this stuff. And yeah. so I think for a lot of people, whenever they're just getting into macro tracking, feel free after a while and like you've kind of figured out your baseline to play around with these different macro ranges because people respond just so differently and even just consider how do i enjoy eating i know for me question. personally like i love a more high fat diet because i love coconut oil i love using oils whenever Same. i cook i eat higher fat meats and whenever i try to intentionally bring that down it becomes more of like a restrictive mindset yep. and it's not even yep. you know when we talk about restriction it's not always calorie restriction like physical restriction mm -hmm. if you subconsciously feel restricted like I can't have this or I have to stop at this yeah it will create this craving it will create this heightened desire and that's gonna throw off those hunger and fullness cues and so we just want to make sure that regardless of what diet you're following you do not feel restricted yep 
And it's so, I love that question. I love that you asked the question, how do you feel? Like, how does this diet make you feel? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of women don't check in on themselves yeah. because they think I need to be eating this way. Mm -hmm. I need to look this way. I need to do this. And they don't actually ask themselves, am I enjoying this? How do I feel? How are my energy levels? You know, am I happy? Like, yeah. et cetera. Or do I feel restricted? Am I subconsciously telling myself at dinner, oh, I can't fucking order that. Yeah. yeah. Et cetera, yeah. whatever it is. Well, um, and I think important. we see, unfortunately, you know, we all compare ourselves to people on social mm -hmm. media, right? Mm -hmm. And I think people will automatically assume if I eat the way that this person eats, yes. I will look like this person. If I train the way that they will, I will look like this person. And really, we have to remember that a lot of these people are not dietitians. A lot of them are not health professionals. And a lot of them are just kind of following guidance that they've been given or they've heard yeah. in the past mm -hmm. or what gave them their results in terms of physique but they're not paying attention to metabolically what's going mm -hmm. on i have i, I talked to so many women that their goal as far as like physique is still what they weighed in high school or college yeah. or the physique that they had at the end of a bodybuilding competition yep. and i have to ask them okay but i want you to ask yourself you know, aside from what you looked like, how did you feel on a day-to-day -day basis? If you were food obsessed, if you have to track everything, if you get anxiety about, oh my God, I didn't have two eggs because one of them broke this morning, what the heck do I do? That is not a healthy relationship with yeah. food. And that is a big sign that maybe this isn't the diet for you. And especially if it is at an expense of some of those macronutrients, because physically you're gonna feel it. Yeah. And something that you have to remind yourself, you know, as far as like comparing yourself to people on social media is like, you have no idea what's going on with them. Yeah. Like you don't know if they lost their periods. Like you don't yeah. know if they're actually like in a healthy place with food, like yeah. their mindset, like, you don't know anything. So yeah. it's, yeah. It's You'll never look like someone slope, yeah. if you train and eat the same way they do. Yeah. So regardless, ask yourself those questions. It's super important. I yeah. love that. Yeah. So next question is, my body seems to really want to keep my belly fat. Any suggestions? Well, we will say you cannot spot reduce. Okay. Like, <laughs> I, I've been clapping the whole yeah. time. I don't <laughs> care how many exercises there are for lower belly. Or, like, yes, we can target things, but really whenever it comes to like midsection weight gain, that insulin resistance is a major component because we will store that extra blood sugar in our fat cells around our organs so that they're easy access. Yeah. And so whenever I talk to women and they're storing weight in their belly, in their hips, in their thighs, it's typically, I mean, nine times out of 10, it's a blood sugar issue. And mm. so we just want to make sure again, that you're following those just foundational blood sugar steps, balance your meals, don't skip your meals, eat frequently throughout the day, and then also stress management is a big component. Absolutely. Also, when you mentioned spot reducing and like some exercises can target, you know, certain places, also certain exercises affect people differently. Like oh, yeah. me and my best friend work out together every single day. We do the same workouts. Our bodies are completely different. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. going to be different for everyone. Such a beautiful thing. But yeah, <laughs> you'll see the videos that are like, do this workout and get a six pack. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. complete. Number one, you can't spot, spot reduce fat ever. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a low enough body fat percentage to see your abdominals in the yeah. first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not going to give you those abs just if we're doing that workout. Yeah. That drives me well, nuts. that's, I get the question a lot and I know you do, you do too, is people will ask, okay, well, I want to grow my glutes. Like I want to grow some muscle, but I also want to lose fat in this area. Yes. And you know, I, I typically will explain to people, um, and this is really common to hear in the fitness industry, in the beginning of someone's journey, whether they've never worked out before, they've never really paid attention to their nutrition, body recomposition is what's gonna happen for like the first year. So you will lose fat and build mm -hmm. muscle at the same time because your body's like, it's a whole new world. <laughs> like I'm just responding to it, you know? But then typically after that time, you kind of have to pick and choose what you want to yeah. focus on first. Mm -hmm. And I know personally, I mean, obviously I work with a lot of women who we need to work on the, the metabolic repair side things first. But for a lot of women, I recommend, you know, build that dense muscle tissue oh, yeah. first mm -hmm. and then go through a fat loss phase so that you can see your hard work. That's what I was going to say. Because yeah. most people are like, I just need to cut right, right away. And I'm like, but yeah. then you're not going to have that, the curves like, you're looking for in the definition. Like, mm -hmm. or, yeah, yeah, because the muscle wasn't built there. So yeah. let's go through that muscle building exactly. phase, give your body the nutrients it needs, get that metabolism back in the that, same the place. The muscle burns so many calories. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. yeah and, and the thing is like, 
there's just no better phrase for it right now but if you guys have heard of the term like skinny fat like when people mm -hmm. feel like they don't have a lot of muscle definition but they're yeah. they're in a smaller body that's what we're referring to like that's why you want to build the muscle tissue first because otherwise you're, you're going to have that look which that's completely fine but if you're going after the toned look if you yeah. want to look like hey i've spent the past six months really building this tissue then you want to work on that first yeah mm -hmm. great advice all right next question this is a great one so how to fight sweet cravings especially when on period so what are cravings what are they telling us yeah Cravings are just a signal from your body. It's your, our body's always communicating with us. And so it's not something that we want to hack, that we want to avoid, that is something that. bad. It's, it's giving us a sign. And so we need to ask like, okay, well, where is this coming from? Is it something like, let's say I'm craving a pizza. Okay, well, are you physically craving it? Are you mentally craving it? Mm. You know, I, I have been tracking, I hear this a lot, I've been tracking all week long, I do so good, and then the weekends come by. Yeah. And then that diet that you're following Monday through Friday is not sustainable for you. Even mm. if it's not calorie-wise, even if it's nothing to do with the numbers, you may not be eating foods that you actually enjoy. And yeah, that's, that's where so we can key. do things like yeah. create, like eating healthier versions of foods that are yeah. our favorites. Mm -hmm. Like we share a lot of like homemade pizza recipes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Or like mm -hmm. you can make, you know, grass fed burgers with oh, like yeah. a healthier bun mm -hmm. instead of going to Big McDonald's Mac or bowls. something. Yeah, absolutely. And we try to bring a lot of that to this space because that is such an important component of having a healthy relationship with food and yes. being able to be consistent with this journey. Yes. And I just feel like when it comes to cravings, the blood sugar is gonna be the biggest component. Always come back to blood sugar. It always blood comes sugar. back because when we are constantly spiking our blood sugar, it's it's not even necessarily. I think when people hear blood sugar, they think, oh well, I'm not just eating carbs all day long, yeah. and like I'm not just eating sweets all day long. No, that that's not always the case. But if you're every day or two or three times a day having these major spikes and then drops, yeah. that's actually gonna lead to the insulin resistance issues the same way as if you were eating that candy all day long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we just want to make sure, you know, your strength training so that you're using mm -hmm. that glycogen, like that's going to be really important, but you're also just keeping that blood sugar stable throughout the day because you guys will notice if you have like a major sweet tooth and you go through a period where you're retraining your taste buds by eating more whole foods and mm -hmm. your body is just getting used to that kind of sweetness, like real this sweetness. Is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead yeah. of just like artificial hijacked sweetness, like yeah. even fruits, like I'm the biggest fruit stan. I, I <laughs> love it just yeah. basically every meal, but even the fruit that we have now is not the way that it was, you know, mm -hmm. a few hundred years ago. And it, it has been bred to be super sweet. And yeah. so if someone is having something like that all day, every day without the protein, without the yeah. fat, and they're spiking that blood sugar, they're going to have the insulin resistance issues. They're going to have the cravings and the cravings are coming from that blood sugar mismanagement because whenever we spike it and then whenever it drops, that's where the cravings come in. So just ask yourself, how am I eating throughout the day? Am I under eating in general? Am I eating that breakfast? Am I eating consistently? And what is the balance of the carbs, proteins, and fats? And what is, just to clarify, because I know people are gonna be like, well, how do I know if I'm under eating? Mm -hmm. Like, what would you say is a sign or an amount or something where you could be like, okay, you're definitely probably under eating yeah. here? Well, just like what we answered with our first question, definitely utilize the Sculpt2 calculator just yeah. to see what your estimated needs should be. And then if you can, go ahead and track for a few weeks just to compare the two numbers. But honestly, even if someone's not tracking calories because you know mentally it's just not yeah. the right choice for them, which is, is totally fine, I really focus a lot on metabolism. And so some of the telltale signs of having a healthy metabolism, you're having regular bowel movements every day mm -hmm. that are full and complete. A little, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of bloating after a meal is normal, but not excessive bloating. That yeah. can even be a sign of under eating because your digestive system needs calories too. Yeah. And so it's not just, oh, I'm responding to this food or I just have bloat. 
you may still not be giving your body enough fuel to actually mm. process it. So it's just yeah. sitting there, you know, creating wow. all of this gas. And then of course we want to make sure, you know, mood is stable, energy stable. I have an appetite when I wake up and yeah. throughout the day, um, you know, clear skin, mm. healthy hair. And obviously like our period is kind of like a monthly report card. Mm. And so if you oh, notice, like them. yeah, mm. if you notice like I'm having painful periods every single month or I'm late this month and I'm early Early this month like they're just mm -hmm. so irregular yeah. or I can't function when I'm on my period I have yeah. such mm -hmm. low energy these are all signs that your metabolism needs a little bit of TLC yeah. there's also you know there's fatigue you know if you're not yeah. eating enough and then um <laughs> The thing that I was gonna say just came out. Oh, <laughs> if you're, that's a good thing with the camera. Like, wait, hold on, wait a um, If you're feeling hungry, like right after you're eating, you know, you're most likely not eating enough, or you know, there's not enough fats oh. or carbs. So that's yeah. something to look at too. Like right after, or like a little soon after, even. Yeah. I mean, okay. there's right after, or like even like an, an hour after. Like yeah. if you're feeling if people hungry are already, the like, fridge or already. wanting a snack again. Yeah, yeah. it's like how, what, so what I, did you just eat? I do have a question. Cause I know <laughs> people are gonna hear this and say, does that mean I can't have a fucking chocolate bar? No. Can I not have That's dessert? Not what that means. Or no, can I have then, chips? Because then you get even more restrictive. You know, if yes. you're just not, like sometimes you, you just give into the craving. Like yeah. you can't just cut yeah. yourself off and say, no, I can't have that. You know, it's gonna ruin my day, my, yeah. my calories for the day, yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know, well, sometimes. and honestly, like it's, it's actually better for like the blood sugar, especially mm. to have the dessert right after your meal or yeah. like with your meal technically. Yeah. So like have your dinner and have like your little bowl of ice cream or have your little, you know, huge chocolate bar or whatever it is, because this is gonna prevent blood sugar spikes later on. Like we still, we're having it as part of a balanced meal. And so if you have a craving for a dessert, allow yourself to have that. Yeah. It's just, how can we optimize this so that it's not leading to blood sugar spikes and crashes? So is it like tuning in to recognize, okay, I'm having the craving, let's see what that is about. And then building it in, like you said, okay, let's look and see if your day-to-day -day is, like for example, what I do, cause I'm a, I'm a huge person. Mm -hmm. I love my desserts, but I will always build them in with a meal yeah. and have them right after dinner. Or I make sure my meals are fun mm -hmm. and like sexy and like yeah. enjoyable. You actually enjoy it. Exactly. Yeah. There was actually a study, um, I believe it was Thai women and Swedish women, mm -hmm. and I, this could be completely wrong. I, <laughs> but basically, they they took their traditional foods, mm -hmm. same calorie, I mean, same protein, carb balance, fat, literally everything was the same. Oh, wow. But they were just different foods. They were traditional mm -hmm. foods, and they would measure. I believe it was iron. I, I believe it was yeah. iron afterwards. They, they measured uh, a lot of their um, ability to absorb these nutrients. And they're like, okay, cool. Let's say it was like at 100% for yeah. those. Then they swapped the meals. So these Thai women are eating Swedish foods and, and vice versa. They absorbed 50% of those nutrients because they were missing vitamin P, vitamin pleasure. They did not. They I was did. like, what is my new vitamin? Yeah. What is, what is, what is that like? Yeah. Did you just come up with that? No. <laughs> no. no. So, vitamin P we, or penis. Because <laughs> if you miss that. Yeah. So <laughs> we want to make sure that we're actually enjoying our foods because yeah. you're not going to absorb the nutrients. That, that is so should. interesting. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that study. Wow, yeah. that's so beneficial. Well, think about like, when your food experience does not start when you sit down to eat your yep. meal it starts when you are planning your meal if you if you're thinking about this food that you're just so excited for as you're prepping it you're actually producing stomach acid and digestive yeah. enzymes like your body is prepping to eat this food and to absorb and access all of those nutrients and so that's one of the reasons why we tell people like a, a tip for bloating like don't rush through your meals. Don't be distracted. I was don't just be, gonna ask you that. Yeah, like don't be driving while you're eating because you're not focusing on, oh, what do I like about this? Oh, the smell. Oh, I like this, but I would take this out next time. Like really be present with your food and just see how you feel in comparison. Like so look at your bloating. when it comes to bloating, because you just we have to fin we're gonna finish on bloating because that's when a huge one. So when it comes to bloating, what are some of the causes? And what are some of the things, I know we have, we always share a lot of tips on our page, okay, here's some tips we can help with bloat, but what are just some of the causes people could be like, okay, these are some of the causes of bloating. Because most people are like, what the fuck's going on? Do yeah. I have like IBS? And then they just go to right yeah. to IBS. Well, like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of bloating after eating is normal. I mean, you literally just put 
food, like yeah. a whole bolus of yeah. food into your stomach. It has to sit somewhere, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's just part of the digestive process. You're gonna create some gas, that's okay. But if you're chronically bloated, or if okay. it's after every meal, then that tells us this is more of a chronic issue. And yeah. so we need to look deeper. And bloating can be from too much stomach acid, too little stomach acid. Same mm -hmm. thing for acid reflux. Mm -hmm. um, it can be from parasitic infections, which I know is like so scary to a lot of people, but honestly, like, I mean, th this is our world. We're constantly surrounded by microbes. Honestly, like, like, you go parasite. Like, most people have parasites, and, yeah. and that's just how it is. In a lot of other countries, it's actually like traditional practice to go through like yeah. one or two rounds of a, paras a parasitic cleanse, mm -hmm. or they'll eat like bitter herbs, and they have no idea that they're doing it because you know their grandma taught them. Yeah, and like so, and it's, it's really practice. just yeah, it's a cultural practice to prevent some of these overgrowths. And even things like stress can lead to bloating, oh, yeah. you know? So we just wanna make sure that like you are in a calm place whenever you go to sit down for that meal, like mm -hmm. taking three deep breaths, avoiding mm -hmm. the distractions, having something like digestive bitters, whether you get some kind of spray or even like the diluted apple cider vinegar, it's kind of like, yeah. It, you, you get like a bonus um, with that because you're not only improving your body's ability to digest those foods, but you're also helping with that blood sugar spike too. I know people are going to be confused by digest, digestive blood bitters. Okay. I know people are going to be yeah. like, what are you talking about? So digestive bitters, basically if you think about, um, say that we're not even using a supplement, but we're using food. In a lot of traditions, they will have like a green salad with some red wine vinegar on yeah. top before the meal. Mm -hmm. Anytime that that we have that bitter taste on our tongue that sends a signal to our brain hey we're getting ready to eat so let's start producing some of these That's stomach amazing. acids yeah so we're just prepping our body mm -hmm. you know so that we don't experience some of those side effects yeah even when it comes to bloating something as simple as you know eating really fast or not chewing your food mm -hmm. like that can uh, contribute to bloating as well oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah and we, uh, I feel like a lot of people, especially if you're working from home or you're on your phone, you're on social media, a lot of people are sitting here, you know, <laughs> yeah. scrolling here and yeah, doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we just have to ask, like, can we not really just take five minutes to put that down, put, yeah. you know, sign off of work for five minutes, give yourself that time to be present with your meal and just see how you feel in comparison. That's mm -hmm. powerful. Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed those questions. And I know we honestly had so many more to cover. So if you guys liked it, um, please let me know. We can always do more. And we're doing so much on the Sculpt You page. You can find so much information there. And yeah, we just want to make you guys feel confident and supported within your body and your health. Because again, it's this was really beneficial and beautiful. So I hope this helps you guys. And send you guys love. Texas, so excuse my grandma, big booty, my standards do send fan.